Paul Pullman has the privilege of having become a legend in his own time. First of all, from his revolutionary work in Unilever, we really managed the incredible thing of making Unilever very much more climate uh, efficient, less um, CO2, and make money at the same time. Uh, subsequently, I thought he would have rested on his laurels, but he has continued uh, important work for the, for the UN, and now a book, Net Positive. I wonder, uh, uh, Paul, why don't you just take it easy? Why do you bother to write another book and to keep um, up your important climate work when you have done, already done so much? Well, thank Jens, and, and obviously great to be back again with my uh, Norwegian friends. I have a great affinity for the country, having worked with many of you and uh, still do now with uh, Sven uh, Torre from Yara or Oswald Bieland or many of the others. Erna, always been a great champion of the Sustainable Development Goals. Somehow I feel like being an adopted Norwegian. <laughs> and, uh, I, I apologize for not being here in person, but it's a little bit hectic. And I'm actually today and tomorrow in the Netherlands for other meetings. But um, the real honest answer to your question, Jens, is, you know, I never believed in uh, retirement because it sounds to me like uh, it, it, you were tired before and you're tired again. And that was not very appealing to me. The, the reason that I stepped out of Unilever as a CEO after 10 years is that I felt that I could actually have a bigger impact in the world doing other things than hanging around Unilever. Um, when you run a, as a company, uh, when you run them as a CEO, you have your formal authority or your bought authority. But there are many things you actually cannot do by the virtue of your job, the limitations that it gives you. Now mm -hmm. that I'm liber liberated from that, I entirely have to work on moral authority. And frankly, I can achieve more than, um, than what I could in the previous job. So it's all about having impact in life. And that guides me at least as long as I'm here. Um, it's very clear that we need to reverse the 50 years of corporate uh, dogmatism and norms that frankly have encouraged uh, short termism or shareholder supremacy, the Milton Friedman theory, etc. And this is a moment that we need to change momentum. I think most companies already are clear on the why we need to change the way we generate wealth and lift people out of poverty but they are struggling with the how. Uh, but there is no doubt that momentum is building across sectors, across industries, and that more and more leaders are beginning to see the enormous opportunities that are being offered by uh, changing actually the way that we um, grow our companies, make it more um, sustainable, more equitable, ensure that we leave something for future generations. So this is really about starting a movement um, I do some other things, but I decided to write a book as well in the lockdown to really start this movement where we have to change the way that business is done, uh, not to the detriment of the world, if you want to, but in the service of the world and, and really address not only the issues, but address with action uh, the speed and scale that we need to move. And this is really what we're talking about. Us Overshoot Day this year which is the day that we use up more resources that the world can replenish, was July 29th. So after that day, we're actually stealing from future generations. And um, I wanted to see if we collectively as a business community, not only could do the things we're currently doing, which is amazing for some companies, but if we could also muster the courage to accelerate that transformation of the private sector and put the private sector actually in a, higher level of responsibility and accountability, recognizing that it's very difficult for governments alone to really uh, make these changes that are needed now. Now, you, you mentioned Milton Friedman. After all, he won the Nobel Prize. He says that the business of business is business. And narrow mind, and the argument is that if we create value through our companies, then it's the society at large that through democracy that, that shall decide how that those values are used. Uh, do you really think business should care about Black Lives Matter, care about uh, 
uh, human rights, care about all sorts of other things, and couldn't that be detrimental to actually creating values? Well, uh, Jens, let, let me first with uh, what you're doing with SCIFT is, is already answering that question. You know, you as a coalition have encouraged the higher pricing on carbon. I got involved again to support you guys when you came up with these uh, 10 principles to guide on greenwashing, yep, yep. Get more responsible. So you've already discovered that um, uh, you know if you buy into the concept that we cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet and every anything you can do by definition infinitely is unsustainable if businesses want to be around for the longer term they have to take care of of the environment they operate in so that the environment lets them be around for the longer term that automatically brings you to multiple stakeholders that automatically brings you to the uh, the uh, sustainability itself now you might say why didn't milton friedman think about that 50 years ago when he wrote his paper in um, in 1970 and i frankly believe that if milton friedman would be around today he indeed would not write this paper the way he's written it then frankly in 1970 we weren't aware of the many unsustainable ways of we were growing business the destruction of biodiversity climate change frankly were not an issue you might say some people like rachel carlson and others or earth day brought it to the attention but frankly it didn't really get much voice and um, companies were not that global leader and they were being held accountable by their local communities to a much higher extent than today and and finally regretfully do i need to say in 1970, the institutions were still working. We could rely on responsible governments. There were uh, cross-partisan cooperation. And uh, whilst now we have a broken system of multilateralism, we have increasingly the xenophobia, the populism or the nationalism at governmental level. And frankly, we have grown apart more than we've grown together. So uh, short of criticizing or feeling discouraged by the situation we find ourselves in my argument now simply is we need to step up and fill that void uh, it is in the business's interest to have less inequality in the world and have a more inclusive growth yeah. it drives their markets it is in the business's interest to continue to use the the resources that they need to be successful in a sustainable way not in a destructive way and the costs that business now is incurring apart from the moral reasons which ultimately will swing people but not at the speed that we need but the businesses are seeing enormous costs coming into their business models that need to be addressed and this is why it makes good sense and now we have the data when i started it uh, 10 12 years ago in unilever a lot of people said, you know, this must be a Dutchman and I know they smoke pot there. This guy doesn't make any sense. He's going to be killed by the financial market and by by the press and everything around it. And some people tried. I didn't have the luxury of the data. But now, 10, 12 years further, we have the hard data that obviously you need to run your company well and you need to ensure that you're in the right segments, that you hire the right people that you keep your cost under control. We all understand that. But companies that are more diverse, also at board level, tend to perform better. Companies that start to realize the challenges of carbon in their value chain and decarbonize tend to perform better. Companies that put purpose at their core uh, tend to perform better. And it's not surprising. They have more resilient value chains, more engaged employees, probably a better innovation program because they're serving the world. And all of that translates itself in better business results. The most striking statistic I've seen, if people doubt, is we, we looked at about 5,000 companies and, and calculated the negative externalities for which the companies don't pay. If you would do that, about 25% of those companies would not make money if they had to pay for the negative externalities. Mm -hmm. Not to be the oil companies. Yeah, increasingly the governments are forcing it back into the value chain onto these companies. That's the whole idea about the European taxonomy, if you want to. But here is the interesting fact, Jens, yeah. that if you look at it by industry and only compare within an industry sector, 
you would have expected that the companies that don't care about these negative externalities, don't care about human rights, deforestation, climate change, would have a higher market value. It's just the opposite. We can now see industry after industry that, that the, the businesses that actively work these externalities to eliminate them, try to actually, actually move to positive, have a higher market cap already, which means that the financial market already has a way to measure these material impacts and translate them into an assessment of value creation. So that ought to be a warning to many of the CEOs who are trailing instead of leading. I'm very pleased that my little attempt at being the devil's advocate failed so miserably. I think you're, you have a very fundamental point. My argument that the political system should distribute the values created falls flat on its face when we see how poorly the political systems are performing. And it, be, it gives us a much stronger uh, ethical responsibility as businessmen than we had previously. So you spent the COVID months writing a book, which, which, is, a, which is a very disciplined way of putting your thoughts together. What are the sort of principal points that you want to, uh, to communicate to us with your book and remember everybody who attends this uh, uh, conversation will get a copy of it so we'll read it but could you give us a brief introduction yeah i, I appreciate you read it it actually is um the book is a means to an end what we're really trying to do is create a movement a movement really that sets new standards of what good governance is and the book describes how successful companies in the future are going to profit not from creating the world's problems but solving the world's problems simply asking yourself the question is your business better is the world better off because you're in it and this is a tough question for most companies right now to answer for businesses to be successful long term they need to show that they have a net positive impact or in other words, make this a better world for all. Where we are currently is, and to put it very simple, is in a, um, most companies would operate under a narrow definition of CSR, corporate social responsibility. And that deals with being less bad. Unfortunately, as I mentioned with July overshoot day at July, uh, July 29th, mm -hmm. um, less bad doesn't cut it anymore. Instead of killing 10 people, I only kill five people. Am I less of a murderer? And this is what we are really talking a little bit. The second one people then say is, okay, I'm not going to be CSR. I'm going to strive to be sustainable. Now, sustainable is a little bit net zero. No negative, no positive. Certainly should be embraced, but it should only be embraced as an interim state. At a moment that we still have to lift many people out of poverty, we still have four and a half billion people living on less than five dollars a day, for example. Um, we already see negative feedback loops and many areas where we've overshot the planetary boundaries, which means that we need to start thinking about our business model as, as regenerative, as uh, restorative, as reparative. And that collectively we are calling a net positive. So the hallmarks of a net positive company, as we describe it in the book, are really the following. Uh, what the book talks you through is not the why we need to do it. We really take that as granted. We say already from the beginning, uh, Milton Friedman is dead and uh, we don't want to rehash that anymore. Most CEOs now know what needs to be done, but we talk entirely about the why. And what we're starting the book with, with a premise is that you cannot have systems transformation if you don't have corporate transformation of companies but you can also not have corporate transformation of companies if you don't have leadership transformation so we need to work it at all levels and it starts with the leaders of the company it starts at the top with the board and the ceo levels and the first thing that the book talks about is how do you create these courageous leaders um, how do you create leaders that set targets that they know are needed uh, not targets that they can get away with how do you get these leaders that take responsibility of your total handprint in society, not just scope one or two or your footprint? And then the book goes on talking about the partnerships that you can drive within your value chain or your industry to have a bigger impact. That's the easiest way, but also the partnerships, which we call um, it takes three to tango, the partnerships with civil society and governments 
to drive the broader system changes, just like you do with advocating for a price on carbon? Or how do you uh, decarbonize Norway faster with at the same time taking care of the 160,000 people that are employed, the 40% of the export that depend on it, the significant part of your GDP? How do you do that smartly and how do you create the partnerships to go into that direction? And finally, Jens, which people like is that the book doesn't shy away from the tougher calls. You have to be consistent in this game. And this book talks about how you deal with money in politics, with corruption, with CEO salaries, with trade associations advocating different things than you stand for with human rights. So this is really what we're trying to do. And the definition, finally, of a net positive company for us is a company that takes ownership, as I mentioned, of all its consequences in the world, intended or not. A lesson that Facebook would be very uh, wise to, to take into account. Companies that operate for the longer term benefit of uh, business and society, that create positive return for all of its stakeholders, that see shareholder value as a result of what they do, not as a myoptic objective. And then indeed, um, companies that partner with these broader alliances to truly drive the systems change that the world is looking for. The, the, and this statement, they're just as courageous as they are necessary and valuable. But we all hear those of us who are active on climate issues that we should be very careful about outlining what it takes, which just outline the positive sides of it. Here you go right ahead at what it demands from us. What does the reaction uh, to, your, to that part of your book be? Well, you know, what we are trying to do here, to be honest, Jens, is to appeal to the people that are sitting on the fence. There will be a group of people that really um, continue to be short-term focused, put their own interest ahead of the interest of society, uh, are in industries that are not benefiting from any of the changes. The festered order is fine enough. So we recognize that. But we think that we see about 20% of companies leading now, if it gets to climate change, for example. And this book really would pull in another 30, 40% of the companies to create a critical mass to really get to the tipping points. And the book could not be more timely. We've seen really major progress. If you look at um, COVID, in the last year and a half alone, thinking out loud, people were very worried also in the beginning that we would be slipping back, just like we did in the financial crisis, that it would be all focusing in on costs and profit, that sustainability, if you want to, or ESG would suffer. It could not have been farther from the truth. We've actually seen in the year and a half of COVID at a macro level, if I may use that, but also at a micro level, quite significant changes. Uh, people have discovered during COVID that you can't have healthy people on an unhealthy planet. They've also seen this enormous relationship between biodiversity, human health, climate change, uh, inequality and the economy, that it is a more holistic issue that needs to be tackled. But look at this for a second. We had about 30% of the global emissions under uh, covered by net zero targets before COVID. We now have 70% and more countries coming in as we talk. We had 21 countries making net zero commitments. Now we have 131 comp uh, comp uh, countries doing that. 2050, admittedly, in the case of China, 2060, uh, we now need to focus on the 2030 commitments. Now companies, we saw the same thing. A year ago, we got enough companies, but they were the same companies. We had about a thousand companies making commitments to be net zero and signing up to the science-based targets. We now have over 3,000 companies. In fact, 20% of the biggest companies of the world now are making net zero commitments. ESG investing is exploding, if you want to. Hmm. Never seen that so yeah. fast. The, the TCFD is now enshrined in laws of regulations in 45 countries versus nine a year and a half ago. So I could give you a lot of uh, examples of the financial market moving and I could go on but I don't want to take more time but the reality is that things are moving our point is really that um, we are not moving at the scale and speed this morning the International Energy Agency came out again and said that the investments needed in green energy 
need to be three times more than what we currently are doing. So this book is about speed and scale. This book is about people that know that it needs to be done, but they don't know quite how to do it. This book is about these broader partnerships. And hopefully this book is about creating in the theory of change, these tipping points that we need. Now, uh, you mentioned IEA, they even said that even if all the net zero targets are met, we ha will have 2.1 degree by the end of this century. Uh, COVID actually gives some cause of optimism. When there is a crisis and that is recognized and people understand the need for action, it is just amazing what society can do and have done. Um, now we're coming up to Glasgow, COP. Uh, where Copenhagen was a disaster, Paris a, a success. What outcome do you hope for in Glasgow? What do you think will actually come out of it? Well, the first thing is obviously uh, Glasgow is just a moment in time and we need to manage the uh, expectations. That is very clear. We cannot expect that um, we solve all the problems uh, in Glasgow and that all the countries come out with exact uh, pathways to get to one and a half degrees. But there are a few things that we need to demand from Glasgow. The first one is higher ambitions from the countries and 2030 targets. We now have the combined submissions of the countries on their NDCs point to a 16% increase in the next 10 years. We need a 45% decline. So by forming the broader business coalitions of the net zero alliances or, or many of the, the breakthrough initiatives or many of the other initiatives that we have at the sectorial level, we hope we can give countries more uh, courage. There are some signs. We have seen Turkey coming in, South Africa coming in. There's now a methane alliance that is being formed that has already 30 countries, Japan, Canada, and others have come in that have surprised us. So this is an important uh, thing. We've seen China make a commitment to not finance coal abroad anymore. So there are some things that are moving us in the right direction. We need to give it the final push to get the maximum ambition from the countries. The second thing we need to do, Jens, is to be sure that we also behave like global citizens. We've given 65, 70% of the, of the developed world two vaccines with COVID. Uh, we've only given 4% in the developing world. We do the same with climate financing. We've promised already for a long time the 100 billion, you referred to Copenhagen. We still haven't gotten that. Encouraging that the US has put 11 and a half billion on the table. Could have done much more, but we take it with grace. But we are still far removed from the 100 billion. And these emerging markets are saying, you know, you guys are not serious. You guys honestly are not serious. You're not helping us whilst we get the bulk of the impact with resilience, with adaptation. At least it's not that the 100 billion is going to solve the whole world, but it has become a matter of principle or if we have a global solidarity or not. Then the third thing that we want to have out of um, Glasgow is that more money goes to adaptation and resilience. And, and you can clearly understand why. We are already overshooting in many cases. We're incurring tremendous costs and we need to uh, channel some money in that. And then the, the final thing I would say is, is to be sure that we have ambitious sectorial initiatives that companies commit to, and that within these initiatives, we also bring the nature-based solutions to a significantly higher level than we have now. Many people still think that this is an energy transition. It goes well beyond that. In fact, with the energy transition alone, as you rightfully pointed out, Jens, we will not get to the targets. We have to restore biodiversity and be sure that nature-based solutions are included as well, that we move to science-based targets for nature. And this is one of the things we will discuss in Glasgow as well. So I, I'm moderately optimistic that we, with the progress we've seen in this year and a half, <coughs> without having had a COP, that uh, we will see progress, but uh, is it fast enough and is it big enough is where all of our attention needs to go. And um, th you mentioned in passing um, methane. I think it gives me great hope that methane, that's about 40% of the climate gases. It is a sort of little elephant in the room and now all eyes are on it. And I think that's very, very uh, useful. Yeah. Now, uh, also if Glasgow 
is a train wreck, as uh, Ed Luce in the FTs uh, feared. Uh, that just means that the responsibility and what we have to do in business becomes even more important. Because what, what really has shown in the past years is that action on the private sector is now with solutions, uh, wind, solar, um, and so on, are found. Uh, the, gov the government sets the framework, and if that frame is too weak, we just have to work that much harder. By way of conclusion, what is sort of the one or two things that you would advise our members to do if we want to maximize our impact on the climate side? Yeah, I don't subscribe to the FT. Uh, this is a simple, a simple position to take that we're heading for a train wreck because it starts from the assumption that everything will be solved in the next two weeks. And that's a little bit more complicated. We have to be realistic that the global governance is difficult, that we have um, geopolitical tensions, that unfortunately, because of not having addressed these issues, we end up with government yeah. leaders that are more erring to the side of populism and nationalism, and frankly, are incapable to deal with this. And without being political, I want to point out the Bolsonaros, the Maduras, the uh, Erdogan's, the Obradors, uh, but also in some of the bigger countries like Russia and China or India, it would be good to see faster progress. So short of that, indeed, business needs to step up like it does now. It is in our interest to be sure that these societies function. So the more we can put these coalitions together, the more we can not only make commitments, but actually show with actual plans that it can be implemented, the more courage we give to these politicians to move. In fact, 90% of the 45% reduction we need between now and 2030 can already be done with technologies that we have today. Mm. So first thing to do for businesses is to make their own commitments, to take responsibility for their all impact well beyond scope one and two, to start working with some of these broader alliances to attack these issues, look at it holistically, including nature-based solutions, set science-based targets, have a price on carbon, make the disclosure of what you're doing, and then uh, form these alliances or participate now in the many alliances that are there, the race to zero and the race to zero breakthrough being the biggest ones, to um, make loud and clear to the politicians that the private sector wants to change, but ultimately cannot get to this broader system change if governments themselves put not the, put, don't put in the right frameworks to do this. We still have um, about $5.9 trillion of negative externalities because of climate change now. Uh, lots of that coming from per first subsidies. We see the same in agriculture. So business now has to play that role, I think, loud and clear to, um, to at least initiate these broader system changes that we talk about. And of course, we as businessmen have a responsibility for, for having an impact on the politicians and doing that through people at large. Because after all, politicians are sensitive about what people mean, the opinions of people, and that is the way we can have big changes. Now, Paul, I've had the pleasure of monopolizing your, your our conversation for a half an hour. Uh, now, our members want to, be, want to put some direct questions to you. We'll have a discussion on that, which Bjorn will uh, lead. Okay, thank thanks. you so much Enjoyed for it. giving me the chance of monopolizing you. And now it's a turn for our members. Well, thanks for what you're doing. I really appreciate it.